It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Oil uh, Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I would normally go to the Premier, but he's on his 10th paid sick day today, so I'm going to go to the Deputy Premier with my first question. Yesterday, the auditor confirmed that seniors in long-term care were abandoned to COVID-19, and we all saw the horrifying tragedy that ensued as a result. The minister yesterday refused to take any responsibility whatsoever, any whatsoever, and went on, in fact, in her press conference to blame everybody that she possibly could, including the Minister of Health. Speaker, the Minister of Long-Term Care has now had 24 hours uh, to reflect on her response to the AG's report yesterday. My question would be, is it still her claim that neither she nor this government will take any responsibility or takes any responsibility for the tragedies that unfolded in our long-term care system with COVID-19. Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite for the opportunity to, to clarify. Uh, as I said yesterday, and have said repeatedly, I take responsibility. I have a duty and an obligation to residents, their families and staff in long-term care. And I have been absolutely consistent with that messaging. So I don't know why that wasn't heard yesterday. I want to thank the Auditor General and her office for her special report on long-term care. And she was very clear and very insightful that it is the long-standing issues in staffing and the lack of new development and redevelopment of existing long-term care spaces that contributed to the spread of COVID-19. And I had a very long discussion uh, with the Auditor General on Monday, which I appreciated very, very much. Uh, we will take extensive and ongoing measures to protect the health and safety and well-being of residents. The $4.9 billion that is going to create 27,000 new, new staff for long-term care on top of the 8,600 and more that we created uh, during the first wave and into the second wave. We'll continue to take measures to shore up a sorely neglected sector. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, people who lost loved ones in long-term care don't believe for a minute that this Conservative government is going to fix our long-term care system, and they feel as abandoned as ever. They weren't surprised by the Auditor General's report at all, Speaker, but they were shocked by the response of the Minister of Long-Term Care. Fred Kramer, who lost his mother to uh, COVID-19 in Orchard Villa, said this about the AG's report, and quoting, no surprises in it, they're getting away with not looking after the people in the homes. Why are they getting away with it, in reference to the government? Kathy Parks also lost her mother uh, to, uh, or rather her father, to uh, COVID-19 in Orchard Villa. And Kathy says this, and I quote, I see comments from the Minister of Long-Term Care about how the government is fixing this. They're not. Jen? They have no intention. It's heartbreaking. That's how people feel about this government's lack of action in long-term care. Why, what does the minister, what does the minister, this premier, what does this government have to say to people like Kathy and people like Fred? The thou Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and thank you to the member opposite for, uh, for providing this opportunity to say what we have been doing and have been doing all along. Uh, since the very beginning of our government being elected, we prioritized redevelopment in long-term care, 15,000 spaces, new spaces over five years, and 30,000 new spaces over 10, in addition to redeveloping homes that were languishing from the 1970s, all during the time that you were uh, you know, in, in support of the previous government in opposition. And, uh, you know, I think that that record uh, should be should be recognized. Uh, the, the inaction of the previous government and and the, the leader of the opposition. We've taken extensive measures, as I've said, on the staffing, on the on the redevelopment, on the building, on the IPAC, uh, the 27,000 uh, new hires that we are positions that we are creating for long-term care to address our increasing incapacity. Response. These are long long-standing issues that we're addressing. Finally, uh, it's our government, a conservative conservative government who's doing it. Um, this is absolutely the facts. Let's deal with the facts. Thank you.
The final supplementary. We get the same story from this Conservative government at every single stage of this crisis. They should act to save lives, but instead they fail to act, and then they blame everybody else on their failure when tragedy unfolds. Speaker, we all know what happened in long-term care over decades, first under the Harris Conservative government, then under the McGuinty, Wynne and Del Duca Liberal government. Long-term care was abandoned by all of these Order. folks, but this Minister of Long-Term Care and this Conservative government under Premier Ford eliminated inspections. They cut funding. They ignored all of the warnings about what was about to unfold in long-term care. They protected private profits instead of lives, Speaker, and they're still doing all of that. At what point Question. will this government start protecting the lives of people and start putting the lives of people ahead of private uh, profits and their own political gain? Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And you know, I, I'm a big believer in dealing with reality and facts. Uh, students in PSW programs that we announced yesterday, $86 million going to 8,000 new positions, funded positions for PSWs. That, that means 10,000 more PSWs are being trained in this province this year um, compared to years prior something that the previous government never bothered to do. It's also our government that will be leading in Canada with a commitment to four hours of direct care for residents on average per day. This is uh, something that has been left for many, many years. Uh, the previous government had report after report. Uh, it did not act. And uh, I would ask uh, the member, uh, the opposition uh, leader opposite, to, uh, to understand how many times she actually mentioned even the word long-term care. Response? I think people can go back and look in the Hansard. It is our government that is taking action on long-term care, the first government in decades. And we will do it, and we are committed, and we have been ever. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. My next question is to the uh, Deputy Premier, but holy smokes, she's a year late. She should have been doing all of those things a year ago. We lost 4,000 seniors to COVID-19 in long-term care under her watch. So I don't think she has bragging rights, Speaker. But my question now is about the fact that this government, 407 days into a pandemic that's taken now 8,029 lives, yes, we've now reached a very grim milestone in Ontario, what they have refused. Every single day they have refused to bring in paid sick days, and now, yesterday, they announce a pitifully inadequate paid sick day scheme as workers continue to die from COVID-19. I guess my question is, where did they come up with the scheme? Did they even consult their own COVID-19 experts and advisors when they drafted up this terribly inadequate plan? Sure. <laughs> Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue having the backs of every single worker in this province until we defeat COVID-19. And Mr. Speaker, we were the very first province in the country to bring forward job-protected leave last March for any worker in self-isolation, in quarantine. If you're a mom or a dad that has to stay home and look after a son or a daughter because the schools are closed, you can't be fired for that. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we eliminated the need for sick notes in Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, I'm proud uh, that yesterday that we announced the most comprehensive plan to ensure that workers are protected, they order. can stay home when they're sick, and we're going to be with workers Opposition and small businesses every step of the way until we defeat COVID-19. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, this government's plan that they announced yesterday, or the scheme they announced yesterday, has been widely panned by pretty much everybody. The science table, of course, wasn't consulted because this government never listens to the science table. Why should they now, I guess? Uh, and here's what they say about this government's failure in their announcement yesterday, that the scheme is arbitrary, stingy, and in the end, foolish. Doctors warn, of course, that it's too few days, that there's too little pay, and that it might, might actually uh, impact workers uh, to put them in an even worse off position than before uh, this scheme is put into place. You know, at a time when the Premier has just taken 10 paid days off to appropriately quarantine, as the experts advise us to do, why do they think 
that workers don't deserve the same thing, to be able to quarantine Question. completely and not have to make a decision between going back to work sick uh, or paying the bills. Why do they only get three when the Premier gets ten? Mr. Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are going to be bringing forward legislation uh, this afternoon to bring in the most comprehensive plan in the entire country. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we are the very first province in Canada to bring forward uh, paid sick days uh, during COVID-19. In fact, Mr. Speaker, British Columbia's NDP government has refused to bring in uh, paid sick days. Wow. But, Mr. Speaker, let me discuss uh, some of the plans that's going to be in the legislation this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, agreed to uh, ensure that we're uh, topping up the federal program. We want to make that federal program $1,000 per week for four weeks. We're the first province in the Order. country to do that. Mr. Speaker, we are going to bring in, uh, if approved by this House, three paid sick days. That's going to be flexible, open, no sick notes required to ensure that workers Response. in this province, for example, uh, will be paid to get vaccinated. My question to the Leader of the Opposition is, is she going to support us to bring in paid sick days for workers in Ontario? Yeah. The final supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. You know, it's really, really important that the government get this right, and they haven't. People are losing their lives every day. People are 41. Over the last 24 hours, lives lost. 8,029 people now that have lost their lives in this province to COVID-19. The ICUs are overwhelmed. 884 ICU patients right now in our hospitals. Essential workers have to put their lives on the line every single day when they go into work, and they shouldn't have to choose between a safe quarantine, as I've already said, and going back to work sick because they can't afford to pay the bills. I mean, I just don't get what this government's problem is. Why won't they ever make the right decisions to support workers, to save lives, and to stop the spread of COVID-19 in our province? Members, please take their seats. Mr. Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, I am uh, truly disappointed to hear that the uh, Leader of the Opposition and the NDP uh, are going to vote against our uh, paid sick leave uh, program that we're going to uh, introduce uh, this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, yesterday the Minister of Finance and I uh, announced uh, that we're going to bring forward legislation to bring in the Ontario COVID-19 Worker Income Protection Benefit. We are the first in Canada to offer the doubling of payments for the federal sick days program. We are also introducing three paid uh, days off for workers who uh, need to stay home uh, if they're sick, uh, if they need to go and get vaccinated, if they need to recover from vaccinations, if you're a worker out there suffering from mental health challenges related to COVID-19, you will be covered under our plan. Bye. And Mr. Speaker, if you are a mom or a dad out there that has a child at home with symptoms related to COVID-19, you can stay home and be paid. We call on the NDP to stand with us today to stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. To the Minister of Labour, Mr. Speaker, throughout this pandemic, we have had we, we have used the term essential workers when referring to many of those in our communities, like mine in Scarborough or in Peel, Northwest Toronto, who never had the opportunity to find a safe alternative to in-person work. Since the beginning of the pandemic, over 3 million essential workers had to work in common work settings. When our whole province paused to stay home and stay safe, these workers never got to stay home or stay safe. They had to take crowded buses to go to work in unsafe factories, warehouses, and other jobs where their health was jeopardized and then their family and community's health was jeopardized. Mr. Speaker, my question is, how do you define if a workplace is essential? Why are, why are in a stay-at-home order, and we are in a stay-at-home order and a state of emergency in the middle of a punishing third wave, and the government's strategy is to ask people to stay home. So my question, question is, how do you determine if a workplace or a worker is essential? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, the health and well-being and the health and safety of every single worker is our government's top priority. That's why, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have now done nearly 50,000 workplace inspections and investigations related to COVID-19 since the pandemic uh, hit the province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, 
We've hired more than 100 new Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development inspectors, which brings uh, the inspectorate to the highest level in provincial history under this Conservative government. And I have to remind the member opposite, through you, Mr. Speaker, that she actually voted against our plan to hire more inspectors to keep workers safe. We've now shut down uh, 90 unsafe workplaces and job sites uh, uh, related to COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, we have uh, boots on the ground every single day into workplaces, uh, partnering lo with local public health units to Response. ensure that the health and well-being of every worker is protected. Order. The supplementary question. Speaker, let the record show that the Minister of Labour, after a year into this pandemic, failed to identify how they define essential workers or an essential workplace. We call them heroes, Mr. Speaker, and deem their labour essential, but we fail to take decisive action on how to protect them. In an early April memo from the Minister of La Ministry of Labour outlined that just in 2021, they found 15,000 workplace COVID infra infractions, but only stopped unsafe work 24 times. We have been using the term essential worker to un undermine the marginalization faced by those who were, who were working precarious and low-income jobs that have put their health and safety in danger. Workplaces have been reported as a key driver in the COVID-19 numbers we have seen in Ontario. We are hearing from our community, from our health workers, that overwhelmingly those who are failing, falling sick are the ones working in congregate settings in factories like chocolate factories and cosmetics factories. So, Minister, my question is, why are these places like chocolate factories and cosmetics factories open? And if we're truly in a state of emergency, why are you not taking decisive action to stop unsafe and non-essential work? Thank you. Mr. Labor. Well, Mr. Speaker, the health and safety of every single worker has been uh, the government's priority from day one. In fact, Mr. Speaker, as a member opposite knows, because she supported this legislation, back when the pandemic, this invisible enemy hit Ontario, we moved decisively. We brought in job-protected leave. If any worker is impacted at all by COVID-19, uh, they can stay home. They should stay home. Their job is protected. Mr. Speaker, we went further. We eliminated the need for sick notes in Ontario during COVID-19. And Mr. Speaker, uh, it was a spring of last year when this pandemic hit the province that we brought in hundreds of uh, guidance resources, tip sheets, posters in dozens and dozens of uh, multiple languages, Mr. Speaker, uh, at Ontario.ca forward slash COVID safety to ensure that employers knew what they need to, needed to be doing, that workers knew what they needed to be doing. And Mr. Speaker, we moved quickly to hire more than 100 Spons. new Ministry of Labour Training and Skills Development uh, inspectors, and I credit them, Mr. Speaker. They've gone to 50,000 workplaces, they've done inspections and investigations, and will continue to do so. Okay. Next member's question, the member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Minister of Health. I know our government, yourself in particular, have been working day and night to ensure the swift and equitable rollout of vaccines across the province. But Ontarians across my ride and the province have continued to ask me when it will be their turn to get the vaccine and when can life return to normal and things get back to the way they used to be. Would the minister please provide an update to the members of this house on our government's vaccine rollout? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, for the question. Since day one, our government has been committed to vaccinating Ontarians as quickly and as safely as possible. And just a little over a week ago, I stood in this house and spoke about the significant achievement we had made in making sure that we had administered over 3 million doses to adult Ontarians across the province. Well, today I am delighted to inform the members of this house that yet another milestone has been reached and we have been able to administer over 5 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccines. We know that many Ontarians are anxiously awaiting their turn and we're anxious to get the vaccines to them. And that's why this week we allowed individuals 45 and older who live in hotspot neighbourhoods to book vaccinations through appointments in our booking system. We are committed to Response. delivering the most successful vaccination campaign in the country, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and I want to thank the Minister and all those on the front lines for helping us administer these crucial vaccines. 
it's uh, quite reassuring to see that light at the end of the tunnel grow brighter and brighter as more and more vaccines get put into arms. Speaker, while times are difficult right now for every Ontarian, people can take comfort in the fact that our government will not rest until we defeat this virus, which is why we committed to inoculating 40 per cent of the population by the start of May. Would the minister please provide an update on our province's progress with achieving that goal? Minister of Health. Yes, thank you again, to the Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Our government understands that vaccines are our way out of this pandemic, which is why we have worked nonstop to ensure we can get as many shots into arms as quickly as possible. We are committed to ensuring that every Ontarian who wants to receive a vaccine will receive that vaccine as soon as possible. And this dedication has led us to a record breaking. Just last week, we administered over 130 doses per day for three days in a row. The continued success means we are on track to exceed our target of having 40% of the adult population vaccinated with their first dose by the end of this month, by the end of April. As we've said time and time again, we will do whatever it takes to make sure that we can protect the health and well-being of all Ontarians. Thank you. Next question, the member for Park Dale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. David owns a home decor business in my riding. He applied for the Ontario Small Business Support Grant in January and was approved on March 14th but he has yet to receive a dime. Sandra Lee owns a photography business and was approved for funding on March 7th. More than 50 days later, she's still waiting for payment. And the government is not responding to their emails or phone calls. Small business owners have been locked down for months. They will go bankrupt without the support. My question to the Deputy Premier is simple. When will the small businesses get the funding you approved? The Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite uh, uh, for bringing that forward. We are working around the clock. We have hired over 100 extra uh, individuals to support and ensure that businesses get the money that uh, they need. We recognize this is a significantly difficult time for them. Uh, to date, uh, we have processed over 107,000 uh, payments uh, uh, directly through the first uh, phase of the program, totaling $1.5 billion. Uh, 57,000 businesses have also received a second automatic uh, payment uh, of that uh, uh, fund as well, totaling uh, another $850 million, so over $2.4 billion in direct supports have gone to these businesses. We recognize that there are still some challenges. We are working through those, and we're going to make sure that those businesses get the money as soon as possible, because we do understand that this is a very challenging time, and we're happy to, to look into those and, and support the member. Supplementary. Speaker, this minister has no clue of the reality on the ground. So many small businesses are having problems with this program. Steve owns a moving company. He was told to upload his financial documents, but the link he was sent doesn't work. He has called and emailed and can't get a response. Small business owners like Steve are trying to survive the pandemic. They need support now, not in weeks or months. They need an application system that works. When you promise something, you have to deliver it, or you're just wasting people's time and putting them through hell. When can Steve and thousands of small business owners expect to hear from their government? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, understand uh, uh, the member opposite uh, and the concerns that uh, she has put forward, but we have also uh, ensured that uh, there are over 100 uh, people, triple the support staff behind the program, recognizing that we need to ensure that the money is, is getting out to, to all of these individuals and businesses. Uh, $2.4 billion of direct support has uh, been paid out uh, to small businesses. We'll continue to make sure that every eligible business that has applied for the program uh, gets the money that they need. Um, we've also ensured that uh, they have access to getting 100% of their property tax uh, paid, 100% of their energy costs uh, paid. They can apply for the Digital Main Street program, which is up to $2,500 support grants. And we also uh, recognize that the federal government has uh, programs in terms of 90% of their rent relief uh, that could potentially be covered, as well as 75% of their wage subsidy. We will ensure that we Response? do everything we can. Uh, to get the businesses the support they need, and that's why $2.4 billion have flowed directly to small businesses across Ontario. The next question, the member for Scarborough. 
Scarborough Gildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 30 days ago, your government released its budget. There was no mention of a couple of billion dollars for paid sick leave. There was only an assumption that the pandemic would be over and you put a, a billion dollars into prudence. It is clear that the government did not want to support Ontario workers or they would not have resisted a paid sick leave program that medical experts and really all workers have been demanding since the pandemic began to protect themselves and their families. It is clear that the government's budget that they tabled last month was out of date before it even landed. The government finally put forward a paid sick leave program, or is putting forward one, which is full of half measures and does not fully protect Ontario workers and demonstrates how clearly out of touch this government is. So, Question. Speaker, will the Premier commit to a fiscal update that contains the financial requirements for better paid sick leave, vaccination leave, and testing so that we can keep the people of Ontario safe and ensure that a booster program is built into it. Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm very uh, uh, excited about uh, the legislation that's going to be coming forward uh, this afternoon. In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, it is going to be very flexible, very generous, uh, very open, the most comprehensive plan in all of Canada. In fact, Mr. Speaker, Ontario is the first uh, province in the country to bring forward uh, paid sick leave during uh, COVID-19. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope uh, the member uh, opposite uh, will support our legislation. Uh, but uh, I do want to point out um, one of the uh, other uh, important initiatives and uh, parts of our legislation that will be coming. And I said this yesterday, Mr. Speaker, but we are also uh, going to ensure that uh, all small businesses and employers are uh, reimbursed. Unlike the Ontario Liberal Plan uh, that came forward, Mr. Speaker, that really would have bankrupted uh, thousands of small businesses uh, across the province. And most Response. importantly, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, workers wouldn't have jobs to go back to. Our approach, uh, I believe, is the right one, and we're going to stand with you. And the supplementary question. Sure. What happened to the Premier's promise for the best program in North America? Clearly, you have not delivered. For over 400 days, we have been calling for a paid sick day program. All members of the opposition have been doing that. And, Speaker, this government has fallen far short. Just look to the South. They have given workers 80 hours of paid sick leave to cover aspects of the pandemic. So, Speaker, three days is not enough to make things worse. The government included all sorts of other things into the program that really deserves its own plan. So will you commit to the 10 days that the experts have been calling for? Because every day you delay and drag your feet, people are at risk. So Question. will you make this program much more realistic by providing 10 days and make it permanent so that people can have paid six days moving forward? Again, the Minister of Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me remind the member opposite that we announced that we want to double the federal program to $1,000 per week for four weeks plus three paid sick days. Mr. Speaker, this is the most comprehensive plan in Canada. If a worker needs to take time off to get vaccinated, they can be paid. If a worker needs time off to recover from a vaccination, they can be paid. If a mom or a dad has a sick child at home or symptoms related to COVID-19, they can stay home and be paid. Mr. Speaker, if a worker Order. in Ontario is suffering Order. from mental health challenges related to COVID-19, they can stay home and get paid. Mr. Speaker, this is the most generous, open and flexible plan balance because we're reimbursing all small businesses Response. and employers. We plead with the Ontario Liberals to finally step up stand with workers in Ontario and join us today. Order. The next question. The member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Solicitor General. With Ontario's vaccination campaign ramping up across the province this month, I know that access to the vaccine in convenient locations is a top priority for many, especially those who rely on public transit or who work jobs outside of traditional nine to five. 
Can the Solicitor General outline how our government has ramped up pharmacy vaccine clinics as part of phase two of the province's vaccination plan, especially for my community here in Peel? Thank you. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. I know he and I have had many conversations about the various phases and stages as we get a more steady and increased supply of the vaccines. So access to a convenient location to receive the vaccine is critical, particularly for those who might be hesitant about getting the vaccination. But where there's ease of access, a deciding factor can help. That's why we've been working hand-in-hand -hand with pharmacy partners from across Ontario to rapidly build up capacity in pharmacies, allowing much greater local access within their communities. To date, nearly 1,500 pharmacy locations are able to offer the vaccines, including more than 150 in Peel Region, seven of which are able to offer it 24-7. Ontario's pharmacy and primary care practitioners have collectively administered almost a half a million doses of vaccines since they began only a few short weeks ago. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. And Speaker, through you, thanks to the Solicitor General. I know so many constituents are ready to roll up their sleeves to get vaccinated when it's their turn. And these pharmacy locations are a great step in the campaign to get all Ontarians vaccinated. But of course, pharmacies are only one avenue through which Ontarians can get vaccinated. With vaccine supply coming into Ontario expected to rise even more than it was in April, can the Solicitor, Solicitor General share how pharmacies fit into Ontario's broader plan to ensure vaccines are as accessible as possible to the people? Thank you. And the Solicitor General. Well, thank you. And again, thanks to the member. I, uh, I'm proud to highlight Ontario's multi pronged approach to ensuring everyone has ac access to vaccines as soon as supplies increase. This includes pharmacies, primary care practitioners, as well as hospitals and mass vaccination clinics as the backbone of our vaccine plan. We've also been working to bring vaccines directly into communities through mobile and pop up clinics in hotspot neighbourhoods. This includes vaccine clinics in workplaces, starting with Amazon, Maple Lodge Farms, and Maple Leaf Farms, which also offer vaccination to the surrounding community. Additionally, community-based clinics continue to open, including the Baps Temple, Brampton and Mac Islamic Centers, and the World Sikh Source Organization. More will open as Response. our supply of vaccines increase and arrive consistently. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Premier. The Premier is on his 10th paid sick day today, and we know that he still has another four in the bank. But for some reason, he thinks that frontline workers only deserve, deserve three temporary days. What's good for one privileged worker, in this case the Premier, is not good enough for essential workers who do the fundamental work in this province. So my question through you, Speaker, to the Deputy Premier, can you explain why the Premier who says he's for the people thinks that he deserves better than the vast majority of Ontarians? Good later. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, if uh, the government accepted the NDP's proposal or the Ontario Liberal proposal, there wouldn't be businesses open in the province because you would have crushed thousands of small businesses across the province because you're going to put 100% of the cost on those small mom and pop shops across the province, which is wrong. Mr. Speaker, our plan is generous. It is flexible and it's open for workers. We're going to stand with workers and families uh, to get through uh, COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is the first in Canada to offer uh, double payments for the federal sick days program to $1,000 per week for four weeks, plus three paid sick days. That's 23 days in total, Mr. Speaker. This includes a time off for people who get vaccinated, Response. who have to recover from vaccinations. If they're having mental health uh, issues related to COVID-19, we call on the NDP to stand with us and stand with workers in Ontario. Supplementary. 
Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to tell the minister, your mishandling of this pandemic has crushed businesses. We're in our third lockdown in the province of Ontario. And so while, while the Premier gets to sit at home and collect his full paycheck, over $4,500 thus far, he's still forcing— Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm going to interrupt the member. I'm going to interrupt the member. Um, you can't make explicit reference to the absence of any member in the House. And I don't need the assistance of the government side with this. Thank you. Please conclude your question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So he's still forcing everyday Ontarians to jump through hoops, wait for weeks, and just hope for the best while they're uh, unable to pay for their bills. And where did you come up with the three days? Where did you, where did you, did you roll the dice and keep gambling with the lives of the people of this province? If the Premier deserves two weeks at his full salary, why is this government trying to tell Ontarians that they deserve anything less? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I joined with the Minister of Finance yesterday uh, to announce that we would be bringing forward the Ontario COVID-19 Worker Income Protection Benefit. Mr. Speaker, this will be the most comprehensive plan in all of Canada uh, amongst all of the provinces. In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're going to double uh, those federal payments to $1,000 per week. It was an, an injustice that uh, the federal government was paying workers here in Ontario below minimum wage. We're going to double those. Mr. Speaker, we're going to bring in three additional days. That's 23 days for workers uh, in this province, but we're going to go further. We're also going to step up in support uh, small businesses so they have uh, a fighting chance to prosper and grow uh, through COVID-19 and after COVID-19. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure workers are protected, they're kept safe, we defeat COVID-19, and that every worker has a job Response? to go back to when COVID-19 is done. Okay, thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health, and it has to be asked today because there are rumours that this government may adjourn the Parliament and go into hiding when we're needed here most to deal not just with the COVID pandemic, but the subject of my question, which is the mental health pandemic created and continued by this government. Four days ago, the CBC aired a story with Dr. Justina Morrow, an emergency room physician in Ottawa. She said, quote, our department is filled with patients right now with mental health problems and patients also presenting who had no prior mental health history who are coming with a mental health crisis. Some of them are attempting suicide because they just don't want to live anymore during COVID, especially elderly people due to isolation. Speaker, this is caused by the longest and toughest lockdown on the planet. Everyone in this room knows it. You get the same calls I do. The Premier and this Minister are responsible for this catastrophe, so I'm pleading with her now, on behalf of millions of Ontarians, will you please end this lockdown? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. The short answer is no. Of course we're not going to end this lockdown. It's saving people's lives. If we had not taken the actions that we'd taken, there, would, there, have, been many, there have been thousands of people who have lost their lives, and that is tragic. That is truly tragic. However, if we had not taken okay. member for York Centre is warned. There would be many, many more lives lost. We are trying to preserve the health and well-being of the people of Ontario and save lives. That's why we have to continue with this lockdown. And that is going to be important for the uh, mental health capacity of people going forward. We know there's going to be lock issues relating to mental health as a result of the uh, shutdown of surgeries and so on. But at this point, we have no other choice. We have to be able to take care of anyone who needs to come into our hospitals. We need to slow down the transmission in our community. Response? That's why the lockdown is absolutely necessary that we continue it. I don't know if the member for York Centre heard me. He's been warned. Supplementary question. Speaker, this government and this minister has no shame. They know the harm they're causing, particularly to children. Lockdown is not the only option. It has never been part of our pandemic planning, and we know how much harm the lockdown is doing. Dr. Jane Little, an Ottawa pediatrician, told the CBC yesterday, I believe, quote, we've never seen this level of kids with major depression and suicidal thoughts. 
Dr. Rishkovsky, Chief of Pediatrics at Queensway Carlton said, they're seeing exponential growth in anxiety and depression among older children. It's not the pandemic that's causing this, it's this government, it's the lockdown, it's the school being closed, it's isolation that Ontario kids cannot bear anymore. Stop pretending it isn't happening. So I asked the minister one more time, on behalf of two million Ontario children, will you let be kids again? Will you let them live again? Will you end this lockdown? Minister of Health. At the risk of repetition, I would say no again, because we are trying to save the lives of children, adults, seniors in this province. This lockdown is necessary. We've also brought forward our roadmap to wellness. We knew that there were many people having mental health and addiction issues before this pandemic even began, which is why we brought forward our roadmap to wellness program that is going to extend Order. mental health and addiction services to the many people that need them. They were not all caused by this lockdown. Some have been exacerbated by the lockdown, but they were not caused by this lockdown. And we are going to work to make sure that every person in Ontario who needs mental health or addiction support will receive that. The next question, the member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is once again to the Minister of Health. I'm aware that our government's vaccination strategy is focused on immunizing those most at risk, older adults who face severe health consequences if they contract COVID-19 and hotspot communities who have been especially hit hard by this virus. I know many Ontarians are anxious to receive the vaccine, so would the minister please inform the members of this House how our government is making sure every eligible Ontarian who wants a vaccine is able to receive one? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Aurora Oak Ridges and Richmond Hill for this question. Our government has said from the beginning that our focus will need to be on protecting the most vulnerable in our communities, which is why we are using a variety of delivery channels for vaccines to ensure that every person who wants to receive a vaccine can do so. One of these delivery methods are mobile vaccination teams, which have been deployed across the province and just recently started administering shots to those 18 years of age and older in select hotspot neighbourhoods in Toronto and Peel. Additionally, we included childcare workers in our vaccine prioritization to ensure these vulnerable workers are protected from COVID-19. This is a team effort, Order. and we will continue to work collaboratively with vaccination sites and other healthcare Spons. workers to ensure that we have the most successful vaccine program in the country. The member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister. And that's uh, fantastic to hear that our government is making every effort possible to ensure vaccines are getting to those who need them. I also know that we have made significant strides in the areas of testing in order to make sure Ontarians who need a test can receive their results swiftly. I've also been told that our world-class testing system allows public health units to quickly no be notified of positive cases of COVID-19 and allows them to take the proper steps to notify individuals and keep their communities safe. Would the minister please provide this House with an update on our province's testing strategy? Mr. Well, thank you again to the member for that question. And Speaker, our government knows that testing is very important in defeating COVID-19, and we've made it clear that testing is a priority. The sooner we can identify cases, the sooner we can stop the spread of this virus, which is why we've made significant investments in our testing strategy that has seen over 14 million Ontarians tested. We've been committed to protecting the health and well-being of Ontarians from the beginning of this pandemic. This ongoing effort will ensure timely access to testing, targeting testing to vulnerable communities and expanding the capacity to process COVID-19 tests effectively as our goal. We will continue to work with Ontario Health and our sector partners on ramping up mobile testing and community testing in addition Fox. to having targeted testing campaigns for vulnerable populations across the province. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Speaker, the province's vaccine rollout has been an inconsistent and confusing mess that is excluding far too many people. Two of my constituents, Colleen and Richard, are both 58 and registered for vaccines at Shoppers and Costco the minute they became available. Weeks later, 
they've not received a call or any information as to when they can expect their vaccine. Colleen asked me, how is this possible that we were on the waiting list first, but people in the next demographic are getting it before us? This whole thing is a mess. None of this is making any sense. Speaker, why is Ontario relying on a slap shot system with multiple vaccine waiting lists that leaves Londoners like Colleen and Richard falling through the cracks? Minister of Health. Thank you much for the question, but I would say, in fact, we've had a very successful vaccine rollout. We've already had vaccines delivered. Over 5 Order. million vaccines have been delivered to date. We are on track to reach our priority of, of vaccinating with at least one vaccine dose, 40 per cent of the adult population of Ontario by the end of this month. We've also booked over 2.9 million tests through our online booking portal, in addition to the testing that is available and the vaccinations that are available through our pharmacies. We have over 1,400 pharmacies now available to provide vaccines. Many of them are starting to offer that 24-7 so that people with different work schedules can be accommodated. This is a great success. We are making the pri it a priority to protect the health and well-being of Ontarians, and we are well on our way with Response. over 5 million doses already administered. Member for London North Centre, supplementary. Five million doses is kind of a miracle with the lack of coordination, the daily blame routine, and the leader list deployment. This supposedly business friendly government should be familiar with the just in time system, but instead the deployment has been a disaster. It's back to the Deputy Premier Speaker. While Londoners like Colleen and Richard wait for a pharmacy to call them, other Londoners have had to turn to social media in the hopes of chasing down a vaccine. A few minutes after sending out a tweet about eligible vaccines, one shoppers in London was overwhelmed with people hoping to get an appointment. The pharmacy's appointments were all claimed in less than an hour, leaving countless people scrambling, figuring out what to do next. Tristan, one of the Londoners lucky enough to get a shot, said, I think it's kind of bizarre that we have people who are older than myself on waiting lists to get the shot. Meanwhile, there's people like me who can just roll right up. Speaker. It needs to be as easy as possible Question. to book a vaccine. It shouldn't feel like winning the lottery. Why is it that Londoners are finding out about how to get their vaccine on social media instead of from their government? Mr. Uh, well, Speaker, I would say through you to the member opposite, it's incomprehensible to me how you would consider the delivery of over 5 million vaccines in a short order in a little over a month is a failure. In fact, it's a great success. And we are continuing to roll out those vaccines with over 2.9 million vaccination appointments already booked, not to mention the vaccination appointments that are being booked through the vaccines, the pop-up clinics that we have, the mini clinics that we have in various workplaces. We're continuing to deliver the vaccines. One of the problems we've had in the past has been the vaccine supply. When we didn't have reliable supply chain, we didn't have reliable delivery of vaccines, but that is changing. As of next week, we are receiving significant amounts of the Pfizer vaccines. We are receiving the Moderna vaccines. We are going to be able to increase the number Spons. of pharmacies and other clinics that are going to be able to provide them. And we're going to be able to continue our job of making sure that every person in Ontario who wants to receive a vaccine will receive one in a timely manner. The next question, member for Ottawa, Vandy. My question is to the Minister of Labour. It's really great that the government is finally taking action with a provincial paid sick days program after over 400 days into the pandemic. Maybe we can agree that this does not qualify as proactive and decisive action. For paid sick leave to work, it needs to be simple, quick and seamless. Instead, this program requires that employers be able to pay workers' salaries uninterrupted, submit claims, and wait until they are reimbursed. The science table has clearly outlined what a paid sick leave program needs to look like to be effective at bringing the numbers down. This, pro this program does not fulfill those requirements. In the U.S., the introduction of an effective paid sick leave program resulted in an estimated 50 percent reduction in the number of COVID-19 cases per state per day. So knowing the science, why didn't the government implement a universal and accessible paid leave program that would provide Question. uninterrupted salary support for a minimum of 10 days? Minister of Labour. 
Well, thank you very much, and uh, I thank the uh, member opposite for this uh, very thoughtful question. Uh, in fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, when the Minister of Finance and I uh, made the announcement yesterday, uh, we ensured uh, that we uh, let people know that employers are going to pay uh, the workers, and then the employers will be re reimbursed through the province, and the WSIB is going to be uh, administering that uh, program uh, for us to reimburse uh, small businesses and all employers uh, as quickly as possible. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, we do need to continue uh, all of us uh, together. Uh, work together to get through COVID-19. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we need uh, the federal government to accept our offer to double uh, that payment to $1,000 a week for four weeks. That will uh, ensure that workers in Ontario are getting $25 per hour to stay home Response. when they're sick, and that will incent people uh, so they don't have to choose between uh, a paycheck and their health. Supplementary. Speaker, and again to the Minister of Labour, I hear from essential workers in my riding feeling abandoned by this government every single day. Many have gone to work sick because they need to provide for their families. This no doubt contributes to the continued increase of number of cases in my riding. This new program falls short of what is required to bring the changes in behaviour that we need to see to bring the numbers down. The effective implementation of this program requires the urgent cooperation between this government and the federal counterparts. Does the minister commit to co cooperating actively and urgently with the federal government to implement a comprehensive plan as soon as possible? Mr. Labour. Mr. Speaker, yes. The next question, member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of College and University. Tomorrow is April 30th. April 30th is a significant date in Sudbury right now because the first phase of Laurentian University insolvency process will come to an end. MPP Jamie West has stood in this legislature repeatedly asking your government to step in and stop the CCAA process, and there's no more time to waste. I'm here to ask once again. Will the minister put in place a moratorium on this process? We need to maintain all programs and allow all students to graduate in the program they intended to graduate from without having to take any extra courses or pay any additional fees. This entire situation should not fall on the back of these students. Will the minister finally do the right thing and save Laurentian University? The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, as I've said in this House before, Mr. Speaker, we understand the very difficult situation that students, families, and staff are going through at Laurentian University. I want to make it clear, Mr. Speaker, that 90% of students affected, 90% of students have not been affected, and that the 10% who have. We are working actively with the institution to answer your question directly. Yes, we will ensure pathways to graduation. Yes, we will ensure they are not disrupted, Mr. Speaker. We're working closely with the institution to do that. And while I'm up, Mr. Speaker, I want to say we've increased funding for capitals for our, our universities, increased funding supports to support with COVID-19 offsets. We've increased funding for our francophone institutions, $74 million this government commits to francophone education in the north. We've increased uh, funding for our Indigenous Spons? institutes, and while I'm at it, we've expanded OSAP eligibility. When it comes to securing our post-secondary future in the north, this government has been there every step of the way. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Pour la minute... Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Francophone Affairs. The CCAA is about to be over tomorrow. Franco-Ontarians all agree. Whatever which group we're talking about, we are talking about one thing. We talked about what we're expecting from the ministry. We want this, uh, this university to work for and with Franco-Ontarians. As a minister for the Francophone Affairs, what do you think? Thank you. Ontario invested 
in post-secondary studies in French. We will invest $74 million in 2021. That's added to the million dollars we've already invested. If the federal government really wants to support Franco-Ontarians and post-secondary studies in French, the government he should, the, the, this government should start by offering more services. What is really disturbing about what we're hearing from that member opposite is that, Mr. Speaker, the NDP have had only one opportunity to form government in this province, one. And in this question, we see why. What a chilling foreshadow of their attitude towards post-secondary education. They want politicians to decide what Respond. courses are offered. They want politicians to intervene in independent processes led by educational experts. Perhaps the most concerning, Mr. Speaker, is they want politicians Thank to intervene Thank you. In our independent Thank you very much. Industry. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. The member for Ottawa South has the floor. Um, I live a few blocks away from the general campus, the Ottawa Hospital, and I've always heard orange helicopters going overhead. They're very close, so they're very loud. And I always think there's a story, there's a family up there. I hear more helicopters now because we have to move people. And I want to tell you one of those stories. One of those stories is about Jamie Nguyen, Nguyen's uncle, who's 72 years old. There was no room for him in the ICU at Scarborough. They transferred him to the Montfort Hospital. He died there, no family, no supports, alone. And then they had to bring his body back, and they got a bill for $1,000. It's a lot of money for a lot of people. And so my question to the minister is, Mr. this is Ontario. Can you commit to ensuring that this family isn't out of pocket for this? and that we ensure that patients who pass away are repatriated to their family at our expense. Thank you. Mr. Well, first of all, it is a, it's a tragic circumstance that this person passed away so far away from their family, and my sincere condolences go out to his family. But you're absolutely right, no one should have to pay for this transportation and every effort is being made. We will ensure that this family is reimbursed. I understand they had already paid the, uh, the costs, but we will ensure that they are reimbursed and we're working with the hospital right now to ensure that. And we will make every effort to make sure this does not happen to anyone else. Supplementary, the member for Scarborough Gildwood. Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for her answer. And what I would like to hear you say is that you will use your existing authority to instruct hospitals that patients, regardless of transfer, whether dead or alive, will not face any bill for the circumstances that we find ourselves in. I know what it's like to have a loved one transferred. Just two nights ago, my family and I were up waiting for that decision. And thankfully, our relative was transferred to a hospital in the adjacent community. People are afraid. People are concerned for their loved ones. What they don't need to feel is a health system that is letting them down because the virus is doing that job. So I really need to be able to tell Jamie today from my community in Scarborough that this was a mistake we are very sorry, and it will never happen again to another family. Thank you. Minister Phil. Thank you very much. Well, I would say to the member opposite, you're absolutely right. This should never have happened. This is a very, very difficult situation, I know, for many families where their family member who may be very ill needs to be transported to another hospital in another part of Ontario to receive the care that they need. But they should not be paying for the costs nor will they be required to pay the cost in the future. This will be made, um, this information it will be, of course, be made available to all our hospitals. Um, this, as I said before, should not have happened, and we will uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. So thank you. 
Thank you. The next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the is for the Premier. My riding of York Southwestern is designated one of high risk. We still uh, wait a more, more mobile pop-ups and permanent uh, vaccine facility. I have heard the government talk of vaccine hesitancy. The only hesitancy in our community is access to vaccines. In addition to this, government needs to pay workers so they do not lose wages while getting vaccines. And those essential businesses they work at are asking the government to help arrange and cover costs of vaccinating workers on the spot. Will the government be proactive and move to take those effective measures to protect workers and their families? Mr. I, the Minister of Health. Thank you, and thank you very much to the member for the question. We are going to be accelerating our efforts because of the vastly increased supply of vaccines that we will be receiving throughout the month of May, primarily Pfizer, but also Moderna, and we are going to be having more uh, coming to mass vaccination clinics, more to primary care centres, more to pharmacies, and more to pop-up and mobile clinics in workplaces or in places like industrial parks, for example, where people from smaller businesses can come at a time that's convenient to them, perhaps on lunch hour or on a break after work, where they can come in and receive the vaccines. We want to make this as easy and as accessible as possible for people. And with the increased vaccines that we will be receiving, we will be doing that uh, in those pop-up mobile clinics throughout the province. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. I understand the government house leader has a point of order. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, fairly confident that if you seek it, you'll find unanimous consent to revert immediately to introduction of bills. The house leader is seeking the unanimous consent of the house to revert immediately to inter introduction of bills. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Introduction of bills. I recognize the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, much and I thank uh, all colleagues. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that leave be given to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Employment Standards Act 2000 and that it now be read for the first time. Mr. McNaughton has moved that leave be given to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Employment Standards Act 2000 and that it now be read for the first time. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Carried. Carried. This is a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Employment Standards Act 2000. First reading of the bill, Premier Lecture du Projet de Loi. So I'll invite the Minister of Labour to briefly explain his bill if he chooses to do so. Great. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, people shouldn't have to choose between their job and the health. That's why we're bringing forward legislation today to bring forward uh, to all workers and their families in Ontario the most comprehensive plan of all the provinces uh, in Canada to ensure that there's uh, three paid uh, sick days legislated through the Employment Standards Act and that we uh, continue to push the federal government to double uh, to $1,000 a week for four weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Introduction of bills. There being oh point of order, government house. Uh, speaker, I would uh, seek unanimous consent to immediately pass the Employment Standards Act 2000. Government House Leader is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to immediately pass the Employment Standards Act, the bill pertaining to the Employment Standards Act uh, 2000 that was just presented. Agreed? Agreed. Heard a no. Do you have another point of order? I'll say one last time. Introduction of bills. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.